When I unveiled my 201,000 mile Peugeot 205 as my choice of a new Classics World project car, I did get a bit of stick from my colleagues for how much TLC this car is going to need to bring it back up to scratch. But where's the fun in a project car that you don't need to do anything to? One of the things that Paul pointed out when he saw the car was that indicator lens. 400 quid. And another 400 for the indicator lens that you can't buy anymore. You can understand why Paul might have thought that because the 205, like a lot of cars of its age where they're acquiring classic status but they're not quite there yet, can be hard to get little trim pieces and little lights and little switches that help you complete your project and if you do find them, often you've got to pay through the nose to get them. But I am a man of my word and indeed I got a brand new indicator lens for the Peugeot for £7.95. That's certainly a lot cheaper than pretty much any new parts would be on Aaron's Range Rover. It's going to be a small but significant improvement to how good the Peugeot looks. It was cheap and it should be fairly cheerful to fit. So let's do it. I was told online that the best way to do this is to take the grill off, which means you can then take the headlight off, which then releases the indicator. So there were two bolts holding the top of the grill in there, and because they're 28 year old rusty bolts that frankly have probably never ever been out, with the minimum amount of force I could possibly put on them, and with WD-40 in there as well, I still managed to snap both of them. So that's gonna be a problem for slightly later. For now though, with both these bolts undone, the grill does then just lift away, I believe. Let's just coax it out there. There we go. So the grill is now out. So simple thing to do, assuming you don't snap your bolts in there. And that then gives us access to the headlights, which I'll show you now. So the lights are held in by these pieces of wire that just seem to hook over. So I believe if I push that out, we're already one away. Let me talk you through what now needs to be done to get this headlight adjuster out which has got the headlight and the indicator attached to it. There's a 10 mil nut on this side and I'm holding that with a spanner and cranking against it with a ratchet. It's only just working because the head of that bolt is very rounded and I've had to basically hammer that hex-headed piece into it. After 10 minutes of fighting a rounded bolt head and hammering the Torx bit into it to try and hold it in place, my efforts were eventually rewarded. Yes! That nut is off and that is pretty munched. In fact, this is initially a T25 piece and I've had to hammer a T30 into it. That is the kind of ingenuity that we've got here at Classics World. Will that now come out? He asked, expecting the answer no. And he was right. The two nuts holding the adjuster in place have practically zero access to them, so I have to thread my arm under the headlight to hold the bolt head and crank the spanner about five mil at a time to undo it. I'm not exaggerating when I say this took half an hour to undo one bolt. Eventually though, the bolts are out, and after unplugging everything, the headlight assembly can be lifted out. The indicator and the headlight are held together with a wire clip and a ball and socket joint. With both of them painfully released, I finally separate the knackered old indicator lens. The only thing we need to transfer over from the old one is this adjuster unit held on with that Phillips head bolt there. You do need a screwdriver for that, obviously. Here's one I prepared earlier, and this one is a ratcheting screwdriver because partly they're really cool and partly because after all that stress of getting the headlight out, frankly, I feel like I deserve a rest. And then that simply lifts away like that. You might notice that the screw and clip and washer that were on the old indicator have seen better days. They're really, really rusty, as you'd expect 28 year old French metal to be. So we're going to chuck those away because the new one, rather thoughtfully, comes with brand new ones. And frankly, as someone who's going to have to put this back in, I am so, so grateful for that. So that slots through that channel like that. Again, if you haven't got a ratcheting screwdriver, get yourself one. They're one of the most satisfying tools you can have. With the indicator and the headlights slotted and clipped back together, refitting is a reversal of the removal process. And after skinning my knuckles again to refit everything, the snapped bolts are drilled out and the grill's refitted before it's time to test. Oh yes. So the next thing to fix is gonna be this, which again, Paul pointed out when I revealed this car to everyone, that the aerial is um, 
absent. Thankfully, it's very much possible to replace them, but first of all, we've got to get this rather past its best looking aerial base off. And for that, we've actually got to go inside the car. That isn't the aerial. This is in fact the dome light, but having changed the dome light bulb and thus taken it out at some stage, I already know that underneath it is actually how you get to the aerial. So if we just pull the sun visors out, the dome light then pretty much just lifts away. Out she comes. That there is the base of the aerial. And you can see there, there's a little nut on the end of it. And that wire there is for the aerial itself. And it goes all the way down to the center console where the stereo then plugs into it. So first things first, we've got to undo the nut holding that base on, and then we can put the new one on. And the theory goes that you just crack that, which I think we can already do by hand. I think I might have slightly overestimated how tight that was gonna be. That comes off and then the aerial actual lead pulls away and we can have a look outside. Where if we do this, we can gradually persuade the old base to come away. 28 years of loyal service and good tunes, but I'm afraid your time is done. And here is our brand new aerial base. This is an official one from Peugeot that yet does actually just go straight in like that. Obviously you have to take the nut off the end first, but once you've done that, this does fit straight on. Not expensive either, this was about four quid, and this goes in there like so. You might notice there's no aerial there. The aerial is unfortunately still in the post, but as soon as it comes, we screw that into there, then we plug a head unit in down there, and then we've got some banging tunes in the Peugeot. So now all we have to do is put that over the base thread, which is the cable for the aerial, as we said. And I'm gonna just push down from above to make sure that it goes on. And I believe that is our new aerial base on. That goes in there like that. Sun visor goes in there and in there. Quick test. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you change the base for an aerial in a Peugeot 205, if you've ever wondered that. The next thing to sort in the Peugeot is probably the most infamous bit of it, and that is this gear knob. Now, I've actually had to put a glove over it just to be able to use the thing, because in the crazy heat we had a little while ago, the gaffer tape that was wrapped all over it, or electrical tape, just basically disintegrated and made the whole thing really sticky and really hard to even use because it just left a load of gunk on your hand. It's just dissolving in my hands now. It's... that's... ugh. What you can't see in this video is how sticky this is. It's genuinely... it's like something sugary that's been left out in the sun on a hot day. It's revolting. You can start to understand why it was all gaffer taped up, because it's just... That's not meant to happen. And that's Joe One. Ugly, disgusting, knackered, hideous, revolting gaffer tape gear knob. Zero. Now we could of course buy a replacement one, either brand new or second hand, or we could get some sort of aftermarket one or something like that. But instead, Paul has recently invested in a 3D printer. 3D printers used to cost thousands, but a more basic domestic version can now be bought for about 150 quid. Someone on a 3D printing website actually modelled a 205 gear knob. So Paul downloaded the file, filled the printer with resin, and then left it to print for about 10 hours. And these are the fruits of Paul's labors. How awesome is that? After pretty much a day 3D printing, we've actually made a gear knob for the 205. That is awesome. Now I am well aware we could have just bought one off the shelf, we could have bought one online, anything like that, but there's something kind of nice about making your own car parts. We genuinely are living in the future. Being able to 3D print little pieces for your car from home gives us a bit of reassurance for the future of the classic car world because if there are tiny little trim pieces that you can't get hold of anymore off the shelf or you can't afford them or they're just really obscure suddenly you can just make them and that is a good thing just for the future of the world of old cars. Now one of the things the Peugeot did come with as well as a gratuitous amount of electrical tape on the gear knob is the original gear shift pattern indicator that actually goes on top of the gear knob. Now I've given it a bit of a tidy up and a bit of a clean and the plan is we're going to glue this into here so we've still got that OEM feeling of having the gear layout on the top of the gear knob which frankly is just the perfect finishing touch in my mind. So what we've got here is a lovely bit of super glue 
and a lid that appears to have glued itself on, as super glue often does. So now we're going to glue onto the actual pad itself. Now I don't know which bits are actually going to make contact, so with a good helping of glue all the way around it. And you've got the knob here. It's probably a good idea at this point to check that you've got the layout up the right way. And then we can just press that into there like that and let glue take its course. And what I'm also gonna do, just to make sure that it goes in properly, is I've got some masking tape here. So we're gonna leave a couple of bits of masking tape on this to press it into place just while the glue dries like so. And the plan is that by tomorrow, we've got a 3D printed gear knob for the 205 with the original gear layout on it. Just even saying those words sounds mental. But anyway, this is gonna dry overnight and I'll see you in the morning. The next morning, the glue is dry, and with some Sikaflex to hold it on, the new gear knob can be slotted into place and then left to set. Then I can enjoy changing gear with a proper gear knob, admiring my new indicator lens, and listening to some ch- Oh.